we own our emotions. Mm-hmm. They don't own us. Own us. And, and this is where some of these agility skills, like some actual kind of practical skills come in. Yes. That can be helpful to people. You have this post I saw uh, on your Instagram, which I love. The best question to ask yourself in a moment of stress or conflict. And what you have in this post is asking yourself these questions. What action could I take in this uh, that in that is most aligned with my values. And I and the reason I like this post is because you keep talking about values in this conversation. Most people don't know what their values are. Yeah. And so what happens when we aren't clear on our values in general? <laughs> well, a couple of things have been <laughs> of course a couple of things, of course, like you're talking to like the nerd of the stuff. So I'll say like, well there are twenty three things. There's we, like twenty seven things. If we don't have okay, values so, or we're not clear on our values, so there what are happens a couple of things that happen. The first thing that happens is we are more likely to be subject to what is called social contagion. Mm. Social contagion is uh, where we basically pick up on other people's values or other people's emotions. And so, you know, there's some very beautiful epidemiological studies that, for instance, show that if someone in your social network gets divorced, as an example, even if you do not know the person, you are more likely to get divorced. Wow. Okay. Because this this like divorce is almost like behaviorally normalized for you and you start to adopt it as something okay, that's your own. Yeah, it's like yeah. okay to do. Some other examples. Imagine you get on an airplane and you are, you know, kind of vaguely trying to be healthy, but it's not really connected at a deep level with you. And your seat partner buys candy. Mm-hmm. You are 70% more likely to buy candy. Wow. Okay. And this might sound like, oh, well, you know, who cares? It's just like a one-off thing. But if you think about it, what starts to happen is we, we can start to absorb the way other people live. Uh, our next door neighbor drives a particular car. We want that car. We want that promotion. Like social media, like there's all of this thing that starts to create a context in which our behaviors aren't actually our behaviors. Mm. They are actually the behaviors of others. You know, oh, that person on social media has got that beautiful pair of jeans. I never considered that I might want that pair of jeans, but now I, you know, now I've got to have them. So we start to absorb other people's behaviors. And you, you saw this very clearly in the pandemic. It's like one person is loading their shopping cart with like, more toilet paper than they would ever use in their lives. And now everyone's doing it. So this is social contagion. So is this like, so is this like our, and would our values become our identity then? No. So this is, this is because there's emotions in the world and there's behaviors in the world. And we start, we are humans and we are social species and we start picking them up. Mm -hmm. So, and I'll, I'll get to the kind of values piece because it's really important. So let me play out a a kind of example here, which is, Imagine you, and and this is based on some research on this. So imagine you are someone who has grown up in an environment, in a community in which every message that you've ever gotten is, we don't go to college. Okay, we're not college material. We don't go to college like this is not who we are. But you fight and you, Mm. you, like you do everything you can and you go to college. And then because life's beauty holds hands with its fragility, one day you're in college and you failed your first test or things don't go so well or, you know, something happens like things feel stressful. So at that point, there is a significant likelihood that that person will actually drop out of college. Right. So what's fascinating here mm. is we always think, we, we, people talk about bias a lot, you know, oh, this person's biased and that person's bias. Mm you know, they, they, they're like biased against my gender or whatever it is. But what we don't talk about is self-bias. So, so what is self-bias? Self-bias is when you've grown up in an environment in which there is some kind of narrative. We don't do college here as one example. And then stress happens because stress happens or change happens because change happens. And you fall back into that self-bias. You, yeah, you actually start to use that bias against yourself. So you start to say things like, maybe they were right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Maybe they were right. Maybe I'm just never going to have a, a healthy relationship. Maybe they were right. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. 
So that's why we see at this point, many of these college students will drop out. But now this getting back to values, if you take these college students and you engage them in a brief writing exercise, and you ask them literally for 10 minutes to write down why they are studying this particular degree, mm. why it's important to them, what their purpose is, what their values are, what the core is of what they're doing here, why they're doing it. In other words, you're asking them what their why is. What we know is that that 10 minute exercise actually protects those students wow. years down the track. Because they'll always go back to, uh, it's really hard this week or this semester, but, but the reason I'm doing this is why I'm doing this. This is, this. This is brighter, why I'm doing this. Yeah. And so when you ask the question, which is, why is it, what happens when we don't know our values? Mm -hmm. What happens when we don't know our values is, number one, we start living someone else's life, mm -hmm. okay, through social contagion. Number two, when things get stressful, we, we don't have the, the inner core to actually help us to respond effectively. And, and I often think about this, this kind of analogy, which is, which is um, well, like if we think metaphorically, like a, a gymnast, you know, what's going on with a gymnast? Like a gymnast is, or in any kind of sports, a gymnast is, there's everything going on in the environment. There's, there's, there's the crowd, there's the music, there's the how everyone else is doing in the competition. There's the, there's the individual who, you know, is doing, she's doing her routine and falls slightly differently every time. And yet there is this core that Composure. helps the person yeah. to right themselves, to connect with themselves. And that's what your values do. Oh, that's so good. That's what your values do. That's so good. In this post that you have about that, which is, is this aligned with my values? Which I think is the first thing we should be asking ourselves. Is it aligned with my values? Another one you have here is, I may be right in this in this uh, moment, but is my response serving me? And is it serving my values, really? Is it yeah. serving my values yes. and my vision? Is yes. it serving me from where my values are and where I wanna go? Yeah, like I may be right, but is it serving? Like, exactly. I, I, had this, I had this experience with this individual executive a couple of years ago he worked for the united nations and he was um he was r really involved in food security like mm -hmm. he was bringing food to people who would otherwise not get it and i had this conversation with this individual and he said to me that in order to do his job effectively he needed to work with a particular government official in this country and he could not stand this guy, okay? Oh. He was like, I cannot stand him. I, he's awful. He's like, he's I can't stand person, him, okay? Yeah. And so what was he doing? He's like, and I'm just avoiding his calls because I just can't deal. And so I was like, we had this conversation. And, and the reason that that is rigid is because, firstly, the person may have been right, okay? Mm -hmm. The guy might have been a complete idiot, whatever, who knows? But the reason it's rigid is because he would say to me, this man talks to me like my father used to talk to me. Mm. And there is no ways I'm putting up with it. And the reason that it's rigid is because it either asks for a new childhood mm. or for a new government official. Right, 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 right. Okay? Neither of We're which are likely. Neither of Maybe which are likely. years or something. Correct, yeah, yeah. correct. So it's like this this example again of data is not directives. To get what you want? Is it yeah. like I may be right, but is my response serving me? Mm -hmm. Is it bringing me closer to being the person, the loved one, mm -hmm. to having the relationship, the life that I most want to have? Absolutely, I love this stuff. I feel like I could go for another <laughs> hour with you, but I want to. I've got a few more questions. I'm curious with all your. You've been doing this. Study, studying for how many decades now? I mean, two decades. Don't even ask. Two decades. I'm such a nerd. I'm like, it's it's like a, a an awful party thing. Like, yeah. what do you do? Oh, uh, you know, I'm an emo, uh, emotions researcher. Why I work in emo? Yeah. 
Yeah. More than two decades. You, you've yeah. been doing this for a while. Yeah. Before the interview continues, if you feel like you're not living your most authentic life, not leaning into your purpose, and not living the life that your future self would be extremely proud of, I've written a new book called The Greatness Mindset. And I think you're going to love this. Through powerful stories, science backed strategies, and step by step guidance, The Greatness Mindset will help you overcome all the different challenges in your life to design the life of your dreams and then turn it into your reality. Make Make sure to click the link below in the description to get your copy today. Okay, let's get back to this video. What has more control over us if we allow it? And what has the most power if we step into it? Our thoughts, our emotions, or our feelings? What consumes us and holds us back of the three the most? And which one, if we step into it, propels us forward in a positive way the most? So can I reframe that a little bit? Give it to because me. I want to. Okay. So this sometimes people say things like, "Which comes first? You know, do your thoughts come first? Do your emotions come first? Which is stronger?" Uh -huh. In truth, uh, there are multi-directional effects. So let me give you an example. Um, sometimes people can experience an emotion, and then they that emotion turns into a feeling. In other words, we ascribe some kind of interpretation to it, and. We know that, say, someone is feeling um, a little bit negative, not super negative, but a little bit negative. We know that that emotion actually impacts on their thinking and their decision making. So the emotion impacts the, the thinking. emotion impacts the thinking. So when you are trying to do very creative work, if you're feeling more joyous, you are more likely to think big picture, creative, have lots of amazing ideas. Okay, because again, when you're feeling more joyous, you have a perceptual widening. Therefore, you are able to kind of bring things into being that maybe didn't previously exist. And when you're in a more neutral to negative mood, you've got a perceptual narrowing. Mm -hmm. So imagine you're trying to write a book. This is why we say when you're trying to write a book, do the creative work when you're in one frame of mind and do the more editorial work when you're in another frame of mind. Sure. Because when you're in a neutral to negative mood, you are actually more likely to find errors. Mm -hmm. You are more likely to do better editing work. And so this is this example, <laughs> you know, this is this example in the workplace where people say, oh, you know, you've just got to, people have got to be positive all the time, which is ridiculous and which mm. creates a lack of psychological safety mm. but more than that when you're pitching something to a client being connected and generative is going to create more of an expansive receptiveness sure. but when you and your team are trying to figure out what could go wrong here actually a neutral to negative mood actually supports you interesting well okay let me ask you a question so, about, but, but, let me ask but you i want to like step into the power yes. thing, so let's let's go there because let me yeah, yeah, stay yeah. there let stay me ask there. you a question okay. about sports though because when i was on lots of different sports teams if there was ever negative people negative attitudes it would pull down the entire team you know whether it be during a practice during a game it would kind of throw the rest of the team off if yeah. someone was negative now if you're in watching a game film and yeah. you're saying, how could this have been better? And you're more critical in your thinking and you're assessing, oh, I could have made this shot better or this route, whatever it might be. But it's but in sports, it was never about like having a negative attitude about it because then that would kind of pull the energy down. So how does that work with sports, I guess? Yeah, well, I, I think there's a difference between, again, someone being stuck in the being negative mm -hmm. relative to creating psychological safety where someone says you know the way we're doing this tackle might uh -huh. not work because of such got and it. such got it and As so opposed to just being like yeah i agree with everything yeah, yeah so so saying. it's really it's it's really fascinating when you look at how this plays out in organizations a lot of leaders will say things like you're on the bus or you're off the bus mm -hmm. you know you're with me or you're against me right um and so what's bound up in that idea is that if you say something that is difficult, or if you highlight that something might not right. be working out, something. there's something wrong with you. Yeah. You know, there's something wrong with you. And so what happens? People see a potential error that might happen and they push it aside. They don't sure. say anything because sure. they don't want to be seen as negative. Makes so sense. actually, when you think about organizations and you think about like innovation, innovation holds hands with failure. 
uh, uh-huh. you know, collaboration holds hands with conflict. Mm-hmm. And so you don't actually get to have an organization that is agile without emotional agility, without an openness to all of these difficult emotions. So when you recognize that someone is saying, hey, I'm concerned about the strategy. Mm. I'm really concerned about it. What is that emotion signposting? The emotion might be signposting, not that the person's negative, but that the person actually cares about the outcome. Mm -hmm. That's cool. You know, that they care about the client, they care about the customer. And so when you're a leader and you create the space for the lack of judgment about good sure. or bad emotions, yeah. you move into a different way of being. That's cool. Okay, so, thoughts, so, emotions. Okay, so thoughts, emotions. So the, the, the truth is that these things are completely, you know, multi-directional and neither one comes first. So for all of these things, however, we can be stuck in a thought, we can be stuck in an emotion, we can be stuck in a story. And so this is where these critical strategies uh, come into to play. So I'll give you two examples. You were talking about stepping into your power. Yes. Okay. So you're showing up to a difficult emotion, you're showing up with curiosity, but the truth is you feel grieving, you feel sad, you feel stressed, and that's that's the truth for you. So it is really difficult to read the instructions when you are stuck inside the jar, okay? <laughs> when you are stuck inside the difficult emotion, it's difficult to be able to create the space for values because you're so immersed in it. And I remember, actually it was it was a couple of months ago, I had the fortune of speaking with NASA. And it was one of those beautiful examples where you're like giving the example and it, it completely is like their world, which is this, this thing that astronauts describe, which is that when they go into space, the further and further they get from the Earth, the more, it's the, called the overview effect, the more they see the Earth as being just this like tiny pinprick. Mm-hmm. And that there is something so beautiful that happens in that moment because the astronauts are both reminded of simultaneously of their insignificance, okay, I'm insignificant, and of their significance because there's something that feels so powerful in being able to observe the earth. And we can do the same with our emotions. We can move away from the immersion in our difficult emotions into being able to observe them. Seeing it from seeing them. the side. So or we're above, now yeah. outside, outside the jar. And so there are a couple of ways that we, we do cool. this. It's beautiful. It's like this significance and insignificance. So there's some ways that we do this. The first is something that I speak about a fair bit in, in my work. It's this area called emotion granularity. And it's this idea that very often when we're stuck in a difficult emotion, we use big labels to describe what we're feeling. We say, I'm stressed. Mm. Okay, I'm stressed is the most common one. I'm overwhelmed, I'm stressed. I'm overwhelmed, I'm I'm stressed, I'm depressed. We use these like big, broad brushstrokes. But there is a world of difference between stress and disappointed Mm -hmm. or stress and feeling unsupported. Stress and that knowing, knowing feeling of I'm in the wrong job, the wrong career, this relationship isn't working out. When you label something just as stress, your body and your psychology doesn't actually know what to do with it because Mm. it feels immobilizing. There's like such an enveloping that happens. So you ask the question of how do you start stepping into your power? And one of the ways you start stepping into your power is in you want to start creating space between you and the emotion. You know, Viktor Frankl, between stimulus Mm. and response, there is a space. How do you start creating the space? So you're not fused, you're stepping into So one of the most profound ways we can do this is by uh, developing skills of emotion granularity. So emotion granularity is basically that instead of having this broad brushstroke, I feel stressed, starting to ask yourself, what are two other options? Like, I'm calling this thing stress, but what else is it? And when we start saying, oh, it's not stress, actually it's unsupported, Mm -hmm. what that already literally just in in naming this thing, 
it starts to activate our understanding of the cause of the emotion, what we need to do in response to the emotion, and what scientists call the readiness potential in our brains, the, the part of our brains that starts to mobilize us for action, mm -hmm. starts to, to get activated. And so emotional regularity is really powerful. And I remember a, a couple of years ago, I was working with an executive and he would always say his, his, his big word was anger. He would say, I'm angry, I'm angry, I'm angry, I'm angry. And I started to say to him like, well, what are two other things? Like what else could you be experiencing? <laughs> And he started to say, actually, maybe I'm not angry. Maybe I'm fearful. Mm. Okay, I'm in a new role. Things are changing. I think I'm fearful. And what about your team? You know, is your team angry? He started to connect with, I think they're mistrusting. Okay, mm -hmm. I think they're mistrusting. So you can see, Lewis, if you feel anger, if you are, I'm angry and my team's angry, the conversation is a very different one than I'm scared and my team is looking for opportunities to mm. build trust. Mm -hmm. You can see that the, the, the tone, sure. the, the experience of it is different. And a couple of months later, I was having a dinner with him and a group of his, his uh, colleagues and his wife was there. And she said this particular strategy completely changed their relationship because he would come home from work and he would say to her, are you angry? And she would be, I'm not angry. You know, I feel unsupported. Mm, unseen or I'm or, not yeah. angry, I'm yeah. just tired. Yeah. Okay, so emotion granularity is mm -hmm. a superpower and I know that word is overused, but children as young as two and three years old who are more able to accurately label their emotions have higher levels of well-being, literally longitudinal wow. studies, ability to delay gratification, um, high levels of you know mental health and so on. And if if you think about what's happening here, if you've got a child where the child's now 16 and someone says like, hey, I've got a great idea, let's take drugs or whatever it is. On the one hand, the child wants to feel part of the group. There's a sense of excitement and, and, and connection. And then on the other, the child who has mastered at some level emotion granularity mm. is able to connect with the disquiet and gee, this doesn't connect with my values. So it doesn't take a lot of work to, to mm -hmm. see how emotion granularity is is actually profoundly useful to us in our yes. lives. The world almost feels in its narrative about emotions to be conspiring to have us not see ourselves. And really what I mean here is... By suppressing the emotions or by what? Yeah, so the feeling that there's even good and bad emotions mm -hmm. is, is like...